Well, welcome along to the program. A uh, really uh, interesting program for you today as we address a very large question, a very interesting question. Did Jesus exist? We're looking at the evidence for and against. In some ways, uh, some people may be scratching their head and saying, well, of course he existed. Um, surely that's not in question. But we have a person here in the studio today who does dispute the idea that Jesus ever even existed. He is Ken Humphreys. He's been on the show a couple of times before. Uh, he's uh, an atheist. He's a critic of Christianity. And, um, well, he's been pretty staunch and outspoken in his criticism of the Bible, its history, of uh, Christian history. He's debated Gary Habermas on the resurrection not so long ago. So uh, it should be a pretty interesting tussle as he meets, uh, coming on the phone from the States, J.P. Holding. Uh, JP is a Christian apologist and his Tectonics Apologetics Ministry describes itself as the hardest hitting apologetics ministry on the web, answering Bible difficulties and contradictions. And well, if you go to tectonics.org, tectonics, they're spelt with a K, tectonics.org, you'll find a wealth of articles, information and research that JP has put together in regards to the historical reliability of the Bible and the resurrection and many other themes besides. So welcome, gentlemen, both to the programme. Good morning, uh, Justin. Good, good, good to have you both with us. Well, it is morning, certainly, for uh, JP uh, in the States. So, so thanks for joining us at this uh, time of the morning, JP. Tell us um, a little bit about yourself, JP, uh, because uh, you are quite a fascinating character. You seem to provoke strong reactions from those that you have dealings with on the internet. Uh, tell us a little bit about why that might be. I suppose that's fair to say. It is, as you say, because I try to maintain the hardest-hitting apologetics website on the internet. And one particular commentator referred to me as the Ann Coulter of apologetics, and I think that's pretty fair to say. I, uh, I'm not familiar. Maybe that's an American personality, but Ann Coulter, what, what, what is significant about Ann Coulter? Ann Coulter is a political personality over here, uh, very conservative, uh, writes many books, and uh, does a lot of commentary on the uh, policies over here in our government. I see. So um, you, you, if you like, uh, represent a, a very firm, if you like, position and um, a kind of a no holds barred, if you'll forgive the pun, sort of approach to uh, debating. You know, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're not afraid of using a bit of rhetoric, throwing out a few, you know, word forms that, you know, you might not find in a in a strict debating kind of atmosphere. No, I enjoy my craft. <laughs> <laughs> in a situation like this, though, we really won't have time for me to enjoy my craft. So. No, indeed. Well, we will have to use our time wisely, obviously. Um, tell us a bit about your background, though, JP. What, what got you interested in this whole field in the first place? Well, oddly enough, I was raised in a uh, New Age sort of cult religion, and I was, t I was told uh, repeatedly that Christianity was intolerant and undesirable, and the only Christians I knew ver validated that claim. Uh, and, however, I eventually looked into it myself and made my own decision and that's where I stand now. I've been interested in apologetics since uh, the age of well, 15 or 16, and I've been practicing it somewhat ever since. That's about 25 years now. And um, obviously, since the dawn of the, the internet, you've, you've been using that medium to bring your, your message across. I mean, um, <clears throat> what kinds of debates do you get involved in? Um, I mean, you're, I know that you post on forums, you, you obviously update, etc. I mean, uh, do you find that this kind of uh, arena is helpful, is kind of breaking ground in terms of bringing the gospel to people who would otherwise be uh, closed to it? Oh, to a goodly extent it is. In more recent times, I've taken more to publishing of educational materials and uh, going to look more into production of other kinds of educational materials, such as video productions and that sort of thing. I don't. I, I am on the Theology Web Forum, mm. and uh, I don't spend as much time there as I used to, uh, simply because I've run into all these arguments before, and there's really no need for me to spend time reiterating them with the same people or with different people who bring up the same arguments again and again. And so I've, I've somewhat changed my orientation in the last few years, and that's going to be a, something that's going to continue. Okay. I mean, uh, as to the whole question of Jesus' existence, I mean, where does this sit for you in terms of the objections you come across? Is, is this one of the most unrealistic type of um, criticisms that, that you face as far as you're concerned? 
I think it would be fair to say that it is. I place it on the st on the same standard, and I'm going to use the acronym JNE to refer to that thesis as it is held by whether uh, Ken or by anyone else, not him in particular. And I place it roughly on the same level as those who say that Shakespeare didn't write his plays or that the World Trade Center disaster was an engineered disturbance. You, you think it's on the level of that kind of conspiracy type of I would say so. Theory. I would say it's uh, not a responsible use of historical methodology, but rather it's one in which uh, special pleading and raising of the bar on standards is the norm. Okay, interesting, and we'll probably get to have a, a look at that whole idea of whether Ken is, is asking for a realistic standard of historical evidence in, in the course of his criticisms. Um, thank you, JP, for being with us on the programme sure. today, and we look forward to your, uh, your contribution. Ken Humphreys, uh, as I said, is our other guest, and um, Ken, JesusNeverExisted.com, that's the fairly clear <laughs> title yep. of your website. <laughs> uh, you, you published a book to the same name, and um, Indeed. you have uh, all manner of articles and uh, features on, on that website. Uh, yes, I mean, it's an ongoing project, that's for sure. Uh, yep. Tell us a bit of, of your background then. Did you um, come, come out of a religious upbringing and well no it, 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 i can share uh, that much with you that i mean i grew up in a tough working class neighborhood in which religion really didn't have much of a role to play uh, notionally my my, my uh, mother was uh, church of england but that really didn't have any implications my father was an agnostic um and so i grew up with with very little uh, obligations towards religion and failed to be convinced by it when I became aware of it. Uh, what did happen, of course, it, 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 from a historical point of view, it did capture my interest. You know, uh, the fact that there were organized religions in the world and, the, and, and they made various claims did fascinate me and it's been a lifelong interests. Now, most of my life, of course, I haven't been able to uh, pursue that in any great detail, but I certainly have in the last uh, 10, 12 years, and I've made a particular study of the Christian religion. I mean, it does make pretty bold claims, uh, more so than any conventional history, uh, and therefore one does have a, a certain uh, approach to it that perhaps what you wouldn't apply to Shakespeare or, or, or the, 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 the demolition of the Twin Towers in New York. If it makes such claims that God interfered in, in, in the uh, human history, then one really needs convincing evidence that that's so and not simply possibly it might have happened. Well, I remember the first time I had you on the programme, um, a lot of people in response said, What's, what's his problem, basically? They assumed that there must be some kind of grudge, there must be some kind of reason for you to, to spend all this time and effort on trying to demolish the faith of Christians. I mean, do you have something against Christians well, and, and yeah. their faith? Let, let, let me answer that one, because it comes up so much in emails and from, 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 from the sort of comments I get from Christians who rarely can tackle anything of a historical nature. They do t make that sort of personal uh, a slight that, that the suggesting that I've been hurt or damaged in my life by Christians. Now, I've just explained, I grew up without any, any particular acquaintance with Christians as such. I certainly wasn't uh, uh, hurt by any, I wasn't molested by priests, I had no particular issue with them but the nature of religion as as someone drawn as a child towards understanding history and particularly ancient history religion as a as a topic engaged my interest it is fascinating so set aside the fact whether jesus existed or not and i think we can establish quite clearly he didn't you know the evolution of that religion through its various ages uh, uh, and, and it, 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 it's, its engagement with mankind is fascinating. Everything's there. I love the popes. They, what a wonderful study they are. You know, there is so much to, to engage one's interest. You don't need a psychological explanation as if it's some sort of deviant behaviour pattern. It's a pity more Christians don't study their own history. Well, we are going to have a fascinating uh, discussion. Um, so before we come to JP, um, Ken, uh, you know, most people would say, what are you going on about? Um, Jesus never existed. I mean, surely that okay. that's fairly indisputable, isn't it? Well, let's take that point. Let's deal with this one up front in an honest fashion, in an honest fashion. Most people in this world would agree 
that Jesus existed. I have no question with that. They will say, if asked, of, of course he existed. If you then ask them to say, well, explain how you know that, I think then you would discover they begin to um and ah a little bit in trying to establish it. Because the fact of the matter is, the overwhelming majority of believers in the historical Jesus simply assume he existed. And not only do believers assume he existed, so do many scholars, and I've read many of their books. You can open them, and on page one, in paragraph one, they will make a declaration about the existence of Jesus. This is before they write anything investigated here. They will say Jesus was, Jesus did. Now, that is the problem that has to be stated up front. We cannot say Jesus existed simply because a lot of ill-informed people who have been socialised into a belief system simply go along with that notion and, and assume Jesus existed. I'm saying if there was such a character, let's look at what evidence we can find to substantiate that. And that's where the problems begin. And it's not just myself. For 200 years, scholars have gone down that path and thought, my gosh, there is no evidence here for the historical Jesus. And at that point, the wagons get circled. OK, just maybe pinpoint what these things are then that these scholars would come across, things that, that suggest there really is no evidence for. Well, the point is, we, if we are trying to establish a, a bona fide character, as opposed to a problem, problem, the probabilities of a character, then that is very different. You know, of course there were people called Jesus in first century Judea you know, and Galilee. You know, there's no question about that. You only have to take the fact that if the population of the country was about half a million and Jesus probably was the name held by about 4% of them, then you've probably got 10,000 people called Jesus. Of course there were people called Jesus. I could sit here today and say there are people called Bob who live in Chicago. Not that I actually know any one of them by that name. So this is simply the probabilis probabilistic li uh, uh, likelihood of there being such a character. But if we are to believe the biblical story, we've got to go beyond that and find a particular Jesus that fits the bill. I mean, and we'll let JP in on just a second but just for those who are still scratching their head maybe and saying but okay well what's wrong then with the gospel accounts you know what why do you say that are you saying that they were made up are you saying that they were somehow uh, sort of fables and uh, came a long time later that they were a composite of of stories going around none of which really had a basis in fact all of that all of that justin but i'll say it uh, uh, much more simply late and fake that is what's wrong with the gospels they are late and fake and that's why I make my first point, there is a lack of contemporaneous witnesses. That is, people alive at the purported time of Jesus who recorded the fact. Now, I know, and JP won't surprise me with anything here, the only answer they can make if called upon to answer that very specific question is yes, but. That is the problem. OK. I'm sure there well, isn't well, anyone lurking there. It's a kind of, you know, you've spelled it out in fairly general terms there. I'm sure we'll get into the more, the more, the, 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 the particular issues as we go on. So, JP, your response to this late and fake and the fact that there are a, a lack of contemporaneous witnesses. All right. Well, let's make sure we understand the terms of what we're talking about here. I made a comparison to the thesis that Shakespeare didn't write his plays and the Trade Center disaster was engineered. And his response was to the effect that so this is different because we're talking about God interfering in human history. Well, God does not need to interfere in human history for there to be a historical founder of the Christian religion named Jesus who was crucified under Pilate. We're talking about two entirely separate issues here if we're going to get into did Jesus exist as a person versus did he do the things ascribed to him in the Gospels. I'm sticking here just for the purposes of debate with the issue, did this person simply exist, regardless of whether he did the miracles ascribed to him in the Gospels? Now, in terms of this uh, issue of declarative statements being made by authorities, I found in my research that they make these declarative statements because they've already done the background research, and they don't see a need to reiterate it each time they write a new book. And it has been stressed, again, as he noted, that many scholars agree with this view that Jesus existed, and he has alluded briefly to confessional interests. Now, I listened to the debate with Tony Costa, and he said, well, we would need to discuss why individual scholars who are not Christians continue to believe. 
In that case, one of my questions will be at some point, why does Bart Ehrman still believe in a historical Jesus if he is an agnostic? Now, finally, in terms of the main issue of contemporary witnesses, he says there's always a yes, but. Well, that doesn't matter if the but is a valid question. And in this case, I have a very valid point to make, which is that this idea that we have to have a contemporary witness is simply an invented rule. The great, I'm going to stick, I'm not even going to bother with the Gospels here as evidence. I'm going to stick solely with the testimony of Cornelius Tacitus, which I feel by itself, even if the Gospels disappeared, even if Josephus disappeared, would be more than sufficient to establish a historical Jesus existed. Now, Tacitus reports many events that were not contemporary to him, and yet I have yet to see anyone simply say, well, simply because he is not a contemporary, that means that we can't take what he says as true. The reason that historians don't mind taking it otherwise is because they know that Tacitus did research, that he was a very reliable historian, that he knew his business. Just give us an idea of, of when was Tacitus living and recording in relation to Jesus. Uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to establish exact dates of birth and death, of course, but most people would say he's somewhere mid-first century is when he was born, say around the time of Nero or perhaps earlier and that he died somewhere around 120, which would be the early 2nd century. Now, the life of Jesus, of course, would be somewhere around 4 B.C. to approximately maybe 33 A.D., depending on what chronology you want to use. But obviously, they were not contemporaries. Mm. So, um, but you're saying that's not really the issue. The fact is, he was his historian, and he applied the same historical methodology to Jesus as we trust him for with many other people that he writes about. Precisely. And see, what I'm going to say is that any argument that anyone holding the J&E position, not necessarily Ken again, but just anyone, any argument that they will use to try and say a person named Jesus did not exist can be turned around just as readily and applied to say that, say, Gamaliel did not exist, that Socrates did not exist, and further along, the Holocaust did not happen, Shakespeare didn't write his plays, and so on. And that is because J&E at its heart requires simply special pleading, let's look at the evidence slightly differently for this or that reason, and so on. So are you suggesting then that Ken is asking for greater historical um, proof for the existence of Jesus than he actually would be asking for any other historical character? That would be the case, and that, yeah, I'm not saying that he doesn't give some kind of reasons, because I, I did listen to the Costa debate, I know he gives certain reasons, such as, oh, they had confessional interest, but I'm saying that those additional reasons are simply contrived and inadequate, and that they are not fair play, shall we say. So, so you're saying then, Ken, I mean, and, and JP here is, is referencing to some extent the debate you had uh, about a year ago now with, uh, with Ken Costa, um, with, sorry, Tony Costa, yeah. um, the, the fact that, yes, the, the gospel writers, uh, those witnesses, etc., had some kind of... Uh, a vested interest. A vested interest, Indeed yes. they did. Indeed they did, yes. And, and, but but that, that isn't particularly relevant, uh, according to... Well, no, but let's, let's at least at this point in the debate acknowledge what I said would happen, that, you know, I made the point there was a lack of contemporaneous witnesses and, and JP has agreed that and he has said but. So I think you will acknowledge that far, we, you know, we, 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 it is exactly as I said. Now, OK, we have moved to Tacitus. So let's make it clear. We have moved to our first and I presume our prime witness um, to the, the early in the second century. So this is where Christians turn for the, the, their first witness in the stand. Tacitus writing probably around about the you know, 110, 112, something like that. Now, as a preamble, let me first of all establish something about the behavior of Christians during the period in which they transmitted to us Tacitus and every other source we have to rely upon. Because we're in the unfortunate position now that our evidences have to be brought forward from the very people whose interest is it it is to uh, withhold information or to alter information we don't have uh, a copies of tacitus that has, have come to us without being f passed through the christian filter now have we any reason to doubt the honesty of these christians well let me address that one very directly and say yes we can demonstrate in infinite detail how from the very beginning until the present day Christians have lied and fabricated evidence. Now 
Where should we begin on that? We can begin with the, the very Apostle St. Paul, who actually warns the brethren in, in, in Thessalonica not to be deceived by a letter falsely written in his name. Now, whether that letter to Thessalonians is, is itself a forgery or not, either way, we have evidence here of fraud. That is at the beginning. Subsequently, we have correspondence fabricated between Seneca and the, and the Apostle Paul. We have a fabricated letter, a, a poem written by Jesus himself to the king of, of Edessa, and so on and so on. You know, Christianity is fraudulent in tooth and claw, and it goes all the way forward through the, the donation of Constantine, where the Pope claimed the, uh, a right to the, the, the Western Empire, all the way through to the bone box of, of, of James, which was touted around a couple of years ago. So. We have a source for Tacitus that is tainted by a long and, and dis an unworthy record of forgery. OK, so the contention is then, JP, that your reliance on Tacitus's history is uh, marred by the fact that it would have passed through Christians' hands, who would have added to it, uh, deleted from it. What, what do you make of that? All right. Well, he says he's predicted a yes but, but as I said, if it's a valid but, there's no reason to say that you've got anything on me there. Let's put it this way. As I said, we can use any argument like this to also disprove any other historical figure. I've done the same thing to disprove that Rabbi Gamaliel existed. All the testimony we have of him, except in the book of Acts, which we can discount automatically, of course, comes from the hand of Jews who wrote the Talmud. Well, they obviously had a very strong confessional interest in having a wonderful teacher like Gamaliel exist. It says, in fact, in the Torah, or in the Talmud, excuse me, when Galileo died, the honor of Torah ceased, and purity and piety became extinct. Well, obviously, Galileo must have been a rallying point used to keep Jewish persons in line after the troubling period after Bar Kokhba. I find many things suspicious about that. Galileo was such a wonderful Jewish leader, supposedly, but he's not mentioned by Josephus. Surely he would have recognized him as some kind of wonderful person if he actually existed. Now, you get my point here. I actually don't think that Gamaliel never existed. I agree that he did. But we can use these same kinds of reasoning to dispute and get rid of any historical figure. Charges of bias are very easy to make. Charges of confessional interest are very easy to make. And it's also very easy to arrive at guilt by association and say, well, because of one forgery, that means all these other things have been forged, too. That's not how historians work. Now, he mentioned this, several different forgeries and I, or claims of forgery. I have articles on each, but let me just briefly mention a couple of things that I would say in response to those. In terms of Thessalonians, I don't think there was a forged letter. I think Paul is saying that because the Thessalonians misunderstood his first letter, and he is thinking that perhaps someone wrote one in his name, and that is why they're confused about it. He is just making a guess. There was no actual forgery. In terms of the bone box of James, well, that's been looked at even more deeply. I understand that many of the authorities who declared originally a forgery have been debunked, but that's another issue, and we don't want to get into that mm. too much detail, I would think. Things like the correspondence between Seneca and Paul. Well, I'm not too clear that these things were intended to be understood as forgeries as opposed to something like edifying fiction. I mean, we don't know exactly what the intent or purpose was with some of these documents. This would be like someone picking up a book by Marjorie Holmes, who is a writer of devotional fiction over here, and saying, well, this book, too, from Galilee, was a forgery intended to show history. I don't know that we can be sure that something like the correspondence between Paul and Seneca wasn't simply something theoretical that was put together to say, well, here's what would happen if this happened. Something like a Harry Turtledove novel. I don't know if you have Harry Turtledove over there. We, we don't, but I know the kind of literature you're talking yeah. about, the, the kind yeah. of thing where you, you might, yes, create a correspondence between two character, historical characters, but it's, it's for a fictional purpose. Yeah, yeah sure. Now, let's not be absolutely, we can't be absolutely certain that these, uh, many of these documents were intended to be taken as authentic as opposed to being simply thought experiments. Now, this is a very broad thing, but you, know, you can't simply just say guilt by association, therefore the works of Tacitus were interfered with. You have to have some evidence that directly that the works of Tacitus were interfered with. Now, all we have really, and I've noticed this on Ken's website, is he says that there was a particular point where the word Christians, as spelled C-H-R-E, was changed to C-H-R-I by scribes. Well, that's not a difficult issue. The scholars are aware of it, and we know what the answer to that is. 
it was simply a matter of scribes perhaps doing a little textual criticism of their own, thinking that perhaps someone along the line had miscopied and misspelled the word Christians, and fixing it with the I rather than the E. This is a normal textual critical answer. There is no need to go further into conspiracy. And it is noteworthy as well that when Tacitus mentions Christus just previously, he spells it with the I, and there is no dispute about that word. Okay, uh, I mean, we, we, we're majoring on Tacitus, and perhaps we, we'll keep going on that. I'd like to come to the Gospels as well, because I think, if you like, they are the primary source for most people who don't delve into the history too much, so, so it would be worth doing that as well. But, hmm. but, but essentially, I mean, can, can saying, I respond where's, where's to the... your evidence to, on, on the Tacitus front that, that this was meddled with by over-eager Christians, Ken? Yeah, yeah. can I respond to the, the, the comment of use of conspiracy? I'm not ad, uh, uh, suggesting there's a conspiracy. Yeah? I, I'm suggesting there's a, certainly a tendency throughout the whole history of Christianity to uh, embellish uh, the, the doctrines and, and the sacred texts. There's a, a tendency to put in what they would like to see, and we can see that shown in, in, the, in the manuscript evidence of uh, marginal notes then being written into the body of the text. We can see how the text has been Im improved to meet with what people thought should be there. Now, I gave several examples of, of, of forgery, but we could go on and give several others. One that I will mention, I won't bother with too many others, but you know, the, the first canon list, uh, so-called after moratori, you know, in, in lists actually has the comment, there is in, in circulation uh, an epistle to the Laodosians and another to the Alexandrians forged under the name of Paul. Now, that is not quibbling about misunderstanding. That is a clear statement from a, 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 an orthodox text making, making clear that there were forgeries at that stage. So we're not into a conspiracy here. What we are in, 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 into is the creation of a myth which has been perpetuated through generations. Now, if we want to look at Tacitus in more detail, let's do so, because I'm happy to do that, because I think here is an example of a very famous paragraph in Tacitus, which Christians use an awful lot, but in actual fact has great question marks hanging over it. OK, give, give us this, this passage and why you, why you doubt it then. Well, it, 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 as JP will know, he's referring to something that appears in, in, in the, the annals of Tacitus. Um, I think it's in, in, in uh, book 15, where he basically talks about uh, Nero fastening the guilt uh, of the fire that had affected Rome on, on, on the Christians. Now, you know, it's a very lurid and well-written uh, couple of uh, uh, paragraphs uh, about the, you know, and everyone is familiar with this very, you know, uh, memorable uh, scene of the torch Christians decorating uh, Tacitus' garden, so-called. But, you know, I find that questionable simply because if we look back to the other history of Tacitus, written earlier, that is the histories, in book five, where he actually dis discusses the Jews particularly, he makes no mention of the Christians. He makes no mention of this you know, notorious torching of Christians in, in, by Nero in, the, in his garden. You know, so we can go through it phrase by phrase if we felt it was necessary, but I think, you know, it's, it, it's, it's salutary to note that this primary witness for the historical Jesus is a passage in a book to which we are indebted to Christians who are known to make forgeries, and we can see evidence there immediately how it looks very questionable. It now, looks like it's been inserted. It looks like saying? it's been inserted, yes. So, so it wasn't there to start with. Um, JP. Okay. This is, again, simply this guilt by association technique, and he's denying, he's saying conspiracy. Well, if you're saying that some Christian doing a forgery in, i.e., the 3rd century, is evidence that some Christian might have done a forgery in, i.e., the 9th century, then conspiracy is really only the only way to establish a connection. It's as though saying there is some cooperative effort by Christians to produce forgeries over an extended period of time. This guilt by association argument will not work. JP, it's a same. commitment to no, the fight. No, I will not. I will not allow you to interrupt me, Ken. You will let me finish. Now. This guilt by association argument will not work. It can be turned around just as readily by the Shakespeare people who say, the anti-Stratfordians as they call them, who say that Shakespeare did not write his works. It can be used to say that Gamaliel did not exist and passages by him were inserted. We can find some Jews who did something wrong in the 13th century and say, well, this proves or helps support the idea that this was inserted into the Talmud. 
Now, as far as this thing not being mentioned in the histories but being mentioned in the annals, I have a very simple question. Is everything that is written in the histories also mentioned in the annals? Ken? Uh, I can interrupt here, yeah. can I? <laughs> well, yes, I'm done now. You may, you may go ahead. Uh, no, of course not. No, of course not. All right. Now, that's all. Now, I will, I will let you go ahead after I say this. Since that is the case, then there is no justification for saying, because this does not appear in the histories, we can suspect that it was inserted into the annals. Unless the annals and the histories are exact parallels for one another, this argument has no basis whatsoever. And now I'm done. OK, well, I would say that you know, whilst we wouldn't expect both sources to, to replicate entirely the same material, in certain areas it would be reasonable to expect some support for such ideas. I mean, th this, this episode that is in, found in Tacitus regarding the fire isn't found anywhere else. It isn't found in, 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 in uh, Suetonius or any other writer. It isn't found in, in Josephus. We have this very lurid story, and it isn't found in Tacitus' other references to the Jewish people and and, and and you know that is why question marks you know are, are raised in, in no small order over this this this, this evidence it right. sounds to me Joe JP like this just isn't good enough evidence that there was insertion that there was change it, it's for it you it's all, it's all guilt by association because other people did it okay. it must have happened here yeah, well, all he's done here is say, well, now it doesn't appear in Suetonius and Josephus. And my question is the same. Is everything in Suetonius also in Tacitus's works? Is everything in Josephus? I mean, this is, this is, a, this is an argument simply contrived. It's like, it must be mentioned in every single place. But I don't see any reason to believe that at all. We're simply, simply being, standing back with a gasp and saying, oh my, it's not mentioned there. Yep. This is not significant at all. The difficulty we have with that, of course, is all these various sources, which, as you say, we, we shouldn't expect them to replicate each other across the whole field. But what is striking about them all is the absence of references to the historical Jesus. I mean, that, that is, that is the, 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 isn't, the issue isn't, at stake here. Isn't the problem, though, that you, if you're demanding this weight of evidence, you're asking that you, you can't trust any history from the first few centuries that was in that Christians could have had access to. I mean, is that the problem? Aren't you asking a bit much there? Well, no. So to say that we can't trust it it, 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 it would be going too far. But we have to view it with with a certain amount of care and, 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 and caution, particularly where it relates to matters that are so crucial to the faith. Because what these and I'm sure we could go on to the other half a dozen people that are usually bracketed together these these non-Christian witnesses, is that, that, that all those passages are both brief but very powerful. It's, they have the character of looking like a, an insertion because so much is said that's so useful to the Christians and yet all within one paragraph that is neatly slotted into uh, a, 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 usually a, a very different topic. And, and, that, that, and, that, is, and that is where I think we all should be cautioned. I mean, are you saying that these people should have been writing whole books about Jesus if he was such an well, important character? Well, let, let's take the easiest example there of Josephus. Why, why, doesn't, why does Jesus Josephus say so much about the Christians in one paragraph, and yet the rest of his book, he just says nothing about them? I mean, that, that, that smacks of an insertion. JP. All right, well, I'm not going to deal with Josephus. And in fact, someone else wrote my chapter on Josephus for the book I put out. So I'm, I'm just going to deal with Tacitus, and let me just ask a yes or no question. Does that brief and powerful description uh, also fit with the idea of, of Tacitus, in your opinion? Is it, are you going with that as a reason to suppose it's an insertion there? Are you, are you asking, do I think the language has the, the right character for Tacitus? Yes, and the way Oh, I think, it, I think it does. I think someone who has done that has done it very skillfully. All right, so this is the clever forger thesis, essentially. Well, some of them would have been clever forgers, would they not? And how is this disprovable? Well, I think, that, I think that's your task, not mine. Oh, no, you have to tell me, you have to have disproof available or some possible option for disproof, because otherwise we can simply say the same for the passages in the Talmud about Gamaliel. Well, I, I defer to your knowledge of those particular passages. I haven't looked at those myself. All right. Okay, but, but when we read any document from the past, we obviously recognize certain 
possible problems with it in a sense that the, the author may have a, a point of view that he's expressing. He may be trying to please political forces that are in his audience. There may be all kinds of considerations. Now, the probability about this lurid passage in Tacitus, I would say the probability is that it is forged. Now, we can't say more than that. And, you know, and yet, you know, are we going to build our entire religious faith on, on the questionable uh, rea reliability of, of a, an assertion in, in, in a Roman historian. Just one more, one more response from you, JP, and then we're going to have to go to a break. All right. Well, religious faith, again, is a separate issue from whether or not a man named Jesus existed and headed the Christian movement. We can work on that later. The only reason I have heard so far that this passage might be a forgery is, A, that it is brief and powerful, which makes me wonder whether other passages in Tacitus are likewise brief and powerful, and otherwise they might be insertions. And second, the item we alluded to about the spelling of the word Christians. And that's all I've heard so far. Now, perhaps we'll have some more reasons given after the break. I have uh, at least 19 or 20 items that Dennis McKinsey once reported supposedly giving reasons why this was a forgery. I'll be interested to see if any of these are picked up. Well, we... Would li I'd like us, in a way, to, to get into the Gospels as well, um, to some extent, in, in the next section of the programme. Though we, it's been fascinating tussle between you both on this external witness in the form of Tacitus and, and, and whether Ken does require more, if you like, proof than is, is reasonable to ask for, you know, and that whole question of, you know, is this just a disprovable, undisprovable in the sense of that um, if it's such a, an art, a wonderful forgery, Ken. There's no way we could ever possibly prove it to be one way or the other. I mean, it's it's sort of like, can you ever trust anything in Tacitus if someone could have forged well, it? Well, yes, it is. It isn't. It isn't quite as grim as that. It isn't quite as grim as that. But look, we we are, after all, not not trying to prove that just any any old run of the mill Jesus existed. We are. We, we are <laughs> Uh, we are confronted with a character who, who makes great claims for for his presence on earth and his, his his purpose in humanity's story. I mean, if he was so great, there should have been a residue of his existence. Let, let's continue this discussion in just a moment's time. Um, but ultimately, JP, the point you're making overall is that Ken really is demanding a far higher level of evidence because he says as he keeps telling us for jesus made these claims if you're going to base a religion on someone you really need a high level of evidence and you're saying well that's that's actually mixing up two issues basically yeah you're, again there's two different levels here a jesus in human history who led uh, the movement and there's a jesus of the gospels who uh, did all these miracles Ken's site is called Jesus Never Existed. It is not called Jesus the Wonder Worker of the Gospels Never Existed. If he was simply addressing that issue, then he would have no issue at all with the testimony of Tacitus, because Tacitus doesn't testify that Jesus did any miracles. So let's make it clear. If we're going to discuss, did a person named Jesus exist who led the Christian movement, crucified under Pilate, etc., then that is an entirely different issue as to whether Jesus was a miracle worker, because you know, they could have agreed that he worked miracles, but done like Celsus, attributed it to Egyptian magic or some other such thing. Now, it's, again, why would we have someone, again, like Bart Ehrman, who agrees that Jesus existed as a person, and he is an agnostic, professed agnostic, but he does not agree, of course, that Jesus did any miracles. And this is, there's, can't be, you can't say he has some confessional interest because he is an agnostic. And then you say, well, it's left over from the time he was a fundamentalist. Well, I agree he has some leftover fundamentalism in him. But at this point, you have to say, well, what about someone like Robert Price? Obviously, he broke out of that and became objective. Well, now you're simply going to essentially go to an ad hominem against Bart Ehrman. He just can't clear his mind of that one thing. I, I mean, you're, you're saying that Ken has a very, if you like, Presumably, he, he claims Christians have vested interests in, 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 you know, putting the record for Jesus in a, in a good light. Are you saying that, that Ken is equally in the other direction, drawing on the very, very most out there kind of theories and, and possibilities of history to, to put this case together? I don't use people's motives in my arguments unless it's something obvious or unless I want to make a point, which is not very often with that. I mean, my point is that appealing to people's motives and biases and interests is simply a distraction from the evidence. And you can interpret 
uh, interest in many ways. You can say, well, because they had an interest, they invented a person named Jesus. Well, their interest could also made it motivate them to report the historically accurate fact that Jesus existed. Motive can cause any number of reactions, whether real ones or fake ones. And so it's really a, a straw man is what it is. It's a diversion from the evidence to appeal to people's confessional interests or their biases. I mean, you, you yourself have admitted, Ken, that you're, you're in a minority position um, you know, and the, oh, yeah. the, the, oh, yeah. the vast majority of biblical scholars out there are not making these kinds of claims, no. and, and 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 then you're putting on them that well, that's just because there's been such an overriding assumption in the historical mm -hmm. fact of Jesus. I mean, but but it, okay, let me let me, we, let have me. A, we have historians here who aren't kind of you know tied to some kind of belief in Christianity like Bart Ehrman. Who, who, We're all on a voyage. I mean, Bart Ehrman has gone from a fundamentalist Christian to this agnostic now who may still be believe in a historical Jesus at this moment in time, but he's still a relatively young man. Maybe in 10 years' time he'll explain why he lost faith in a historical Jesus. We don't know that yet. We all evolve in our ideas. Hopefully, I certainly have. I mean, I, I've said this on your show before, Justin. You know, at one stage, if we put the clock back long enough, I, I would have just said as everybody else would. Oh, that's probably a historical Jesus, because you can make that comment without fear of contradiction and without one iota of evidence. Now, the point is, I have no axe to grind in whether there was or wasn't a historical Jesus. I simply found that there wasn't. When I started to investigate and try to find him, I found I couldn't. And, that, and I wasn't the first to do that, because scholars have been doing that for 200 years. They've discovered that there is no historical Jesus. That's why some of them, like R Rudolf Boltman, said, give up on the looking for it, concentrate on Christ you know okay let's 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 move the argument on then I think it is valid to press the point about evidence simply because we are talking about someone for whom at least minimalistic claims have to be made. We're not simply saying he put together a chair or a table because he was a carpenter we are saying he caused the world to be turned upside down as the book of acts puts it you know people's lives were transformed as the apologists always keep telling us they suffered unto death so they would maintain because of this faith so there supposedly was something there that was more than just another carpenter now that is what i say there is no evidence of and when we get into the second century uh, witnesses such as we did with tacitus we're really not talking about jesus at all we're talking about Christians and the people who had a certain belief system. Now, let's move on to the subject of the Gospels then, because, you know, we, we have certain problems there. We do not have first-hand copies from eyewitnesses of these extraordinary events. We have the very opposite of that. We don't have any complete Bibles before the fourth century. We have a few fragments from the third and then various textual references of it in a bewildering variety from the second. Now all that suggests to me that in the early century, that is probably the second century, there was a struggle for an understanding of what they would interpret to be Jesus and his story and the Christ. And that was a battle of ideas finally resolved in the favour of favour of orthodoxy. And when we look at the Gospels, what we have today is the testimony of the winners in a, in a very acrimonious and violent debate. JP, is that is that the way you see the, um, the way that the, the New Testament canon has come to us? Uh, no, and I'm going to briefly comment on those last points before I go into the gospel. Go ahead. Uh, we'll see Bart Ehrman in 10 years. Well, G.A. Wells changed over away from the idea that Jesus didn't exist, so maybe in 10 years we'll see Ken Humphreys change his mind as well, and we'll use that as a basis. We'll certainly have him on again if that happens. Oh, certainly, yeah, I suppose <laughs> so. Uh, inevitably, though, again, if this is just... We could use some of these same arguments that he's using about the Gospels and turn them around and use them for Gamaliel. We don't have any first-hand copies of the Talmud. We can see a struggle between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the Essenes and these other Jewish groups happening. And we can say that Gamaliel was invented by the Pharisees to give themselves legitimacy. I mean, when it comes to this kind of idea, you can suggest anything you want to in order to come up with some reason why there was some sort of tampering done. And so, this, like I say, this is simply, uh, it's contrived methodology in history. It's, it's not based on evidence, it's based on a presupposition that something has happened and we need to find out what.
I would comment on that, that the presupposition is, is on your own part, JP. I mean, you are a committed Christian. You, you take pride in being the hardest sitting apologist and the rest of it. I mean, I have, I have already confessed the fact that my opinion changed. I thought there was an historical Jesus until I tried to find the evidence of one. I'm not dogmatic on the point. If in 10 years' time I find evidence for an historical Jesus, I'll be very happy to come on this show and, and, and explain why. But the problem is I'm not seeing them. I'm not hearing them from you. You know, you I'm hearing defences, but I don't hear uh, you know any strong evidence here for a, an historical Jesus. And we have a much more plausible explanation for why in the second century there was such fractional division in the Christian movement. There were so many contending factions and heresies because they didn't know what to believe until it was hammered out. And then they, 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 it became authorised in their various Gospels that are now in the book, uh, the, the book we have today. J JP? Well, these are very vague summary statements that really don't make an argument for anything whatsoever. And if we want to, again, I don't play the game of confessional interest or bias or what have you, saying I'm a committed Christian, well, Bart Ehrman is not, and therefore then what? Well, he was brainwashed, and he's still brainwashed now, etc. We could just as easily say, and this is said tongue-in-cheek, well, Ken has a website, and he's trying to sell a book, and he's trying to sell T-shirts and mugs or what have you, and therefore he has a reason to defend this point of view. I'm not actually saying that's why he's doing it. But if we want to play this game of he has an interest, he has a bias, that's why he's defending it, again, it's simply a diversion from the evidence. Now, we're talking here about different views of the Gospels. I like what he said about history is uh, written by the winners. I remember Dan Brown saying something like that. Well, my general reply, polemically speaking, is, yes, it's written by the winners and complained about by the losers. But let's see. What we have in terms of these fractions... The, the losers are dead, actually. <laughs> so are the winners, for that matter, in many ways. <laughs> But let's say, now let's, if you want to talk about, say, the Gospels in particular, we don't have first-hand copies, no, and we don't have first-hand copies of any of these ancient works, and yet I've yet to see any historian or any scholar make an issue of this for any secular work. We don't have first-hand copies of any of the works of Confucius. We don't have first-hand copies of any African poems written by some of their ancient people. This is simply not an issue, and that's why we do textual criticism. I mean, on that basis, I've often heard it said um, that, in fact, while you, people like Ken may make some issue about we only have later copies, in fact, the copies we have are, are, are dated a lot earlier than many of the manuscripts we have for evidence of uh, great other great historical characters. We have more... We have closer and better manuscripts than, than many other historical characters. Well, yeah, now we don't have time to get all into all the details that's in my next book, but if you're going to make comparative uh, claims, then if you're going to throw out the New Testament and you're going to have to throw out every other major historical work from the ancient world, including Tacitus, including Livy, including Suetonius, and including the Talmud. It's all going to become a blank slate, and we may as well adhere to the thesis that uh, history actually started with the Roman Empire and the Middle Ages were a fraud, which is a real thesis, by the way. So, so there, there's the problem then, surely, Ken, that if you're discounting the Gospels because we only have later copies, we don't have the originals, and uh, th then you, you're, you're kind of denying us any history. No, no, we? no, no, no. I mean, the, the, we, we, we get the danger of creating a caricature here. Uh, let, let, let me answer part of what JP has said here by referring to something it used to be a, a, a standard comment in my emails from christians that there is as much evidence of jesus as there is for for julius caesar now i heard that so often i did write an article specifically on julius caesar to illustrate how we can have a great deal of confidence in fact complete confidence that julius caesar existed because of the mass of interlocking and mutually supportive evidence now that's different when we come to someone like jesus we don't have a mass of interlocking and mutually supporting evidence. We have evidence of generations of doctrinal disputes. We have the Gospels from the Marcians. We have the, the Gospels from the Docetists. We have, you know, evidence of all manner of heresies that, you know, 
you know, strangely enough, emerge very early on in this so-called religion. And, you know, it's, 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 it's less plausible that the pure doctrine suddenly metamorphosed into 80 or 100 heresies than in actual fact the truth is probably that out of that whole ocean of, of religious thinking, certain ideas crystallise and eventually were given uh, official form in the faction that happened to then manage to, to, to cement itself into the Roman political system. And are you saying that the Gospels then are effectively the crystallised thoughts and traditions that, that won the day, if you like? In, indeed I do. Indeed I do. And, you, and you know, if we have time, we can trace through, you know, let's take the, the, the very basic fact that we know about the Synoptic Gospels, that Matthew and Luke are based upon Mark. Now, most scholars, I don't know if JP does, but most scholars will agree that that, that is the case. Now, what is the relationship there? Mark wasn't one of the disciples. He has not claimed to be an eyewitness. And yet Matthew supposedly was one of the disciples and an eyewitness. Why does Matthew, uh, an eyewitness, copy the text provided by a non-witness? I mean, that's the sort of nonsense that you have if, if you try and take the official story uh, as being valid. What we have in Mark, in its original form, was a much shorter gospel. It had nothing about the birth of Jesus. It had nothing about the resurrection appearances, a very brief doc document, which in in Matthew and in Luke was embellished and developed into a much more comprehensive doctrine. I, I feel like we're opening a whole new area here sure. and unfortunately we're, we're already approaching near the end of the show so I'll, I'll allow JP to respond and then we may have to start to wind things okay. up. Okay, there's not much, uh, I do have articles on each of those issues that he's mentioned. Uh, my article on the virgin birth covers the issue of Mark not mentioning it. Uh, in terms of the Mark and Priority Q thesis, I do adhere to Matthean Priority um, it's, I have a great detailed articles on that, but uh, what do you mean by that? Just just for those who may may not uh, understand quite what it means that Matthew is. wrote first, or I believe it was written in Aramaic or Hebrew first, and Mark wrote later or at a different time independently of Matthew. Both are based on the common oral tradition that they that the okay, the so, so both are. Mark and Matthew both depended on an earlier source. Yeah, um, so it's oral... not it's not Matthew copying Mark; it's them both copying an earlier source and and, and Matthew incorporating that into his eyewitness account. Right, oral tradition. And Luke, I do think, had hold of an early form of Matthew and of Mark. Now, I'll just go back for this topic to the issue of Julius Caesar. I have an article on that, too. And there's a lot of issues involved in that. Like, is do they mean it's usually connected to Caesar crossing the Rubicon in the, in the analogies I've seen? And there's some question, do you mean Caesar crossing it personally, like stepping over the river himself, or does that mean his army crossing, and so on? And what I concluded is that this is not really a good analogy to use for Jesus. The better analogy it was with someone like Gamaliel or Socrates, who was a teacher, not a military leader, not someone who was a great force in government, because that does not describe Jesus adequately, especially especially not as the pagan writers would have seen him. And this is a critical mistake that's often made, and I've seen it on Ken's website as well. He asked why various people like Appian or Plutarch don't mention Jesus. Well, again, we have this confusion between Jesus as a person and Jesus as a miracle worker. When you have someone like Plutarch, let's say he hears about Jesus for the first time. Well, he's not going to be willing to grant that this Jewish peasant who was shamefully crucified was actually someone who did miracles. He's simply going to dismiss that as an unworthy story without any further investigation and not report it. And so we can't be expecting these authors to adopt the viewpoint of the Christians, as it were. Otherwise, they would be Christian sources if they agreed that Jesus did all these miracles. Or they'd be like Celsus and say, well, he was a magician of some kind, learned his craft in Egypt. The, the practice, again, we need to compare to com comparable figures like Gamaliel, like Socrates, like Confucius, who were teachers with a circle of disciples. We would mostly expect the followers to provide the information about that person. As with Socrates, Plato, Xenophon, mostly his followers wrote about him. With Gamaliel, we have mostly the Talmud. In the case of the New Testament, that's what we would expect the most information to come from Jesus. Now, we obviously don't have time to get into these ideas of fractions and different heresies and whatnot, and I suppose there's no way to really sum it up simply. But, you know, we, if, at some point you could discuss the specific heresies and whatnot. But again, this, this is all very broad and vague as we have it right now. And I, I continue to maintain that this is simply a matter of inventing rules as we go along, simply in order to dispose of Jesus as a, as a real person.
Fascinating discussion, gentlemen, and um, I, I wish we had more time to, to delve into some of the, uh, the aspects of this, but it is a, a huge area, as, as I said right out at the, the beginning.